Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar organized by the SID uh, Young Members Group. So, um, I'm Marta Del Zoppo. I'm a member of the SID Young Members Group Board and also chair of the SID Young Members Group uh, in Italy. And today I'm going to chair this event on the uh, development and application of shape memory alloys for civil engineering structures. Um, today, the speaker is Dr. Moslem Shaverdi from the MFAM. So before starting, um, just two words about the, um, our organization, so the SID Young Members Group. So we are, um, of course, the young members of the SID, the International Federation of the Structural Concrete. Um, we create a sort of joint between young professionals and researchers, researchers that work in the field of uh, structural concrete and te concrete um, technology. Um, our scope is to uh, disseminate knowledge, first of all, um, through meetings, events, conference, and also uh, we do a webinar series, and also to encourage the development and organization of uh, young members group uh, at the national level uh, to uh, involve young people in the activities of the SID. So the SID works by means of uh, task groups and uh, commissions. So um, all young people are strongly encouraged to get in touch with these um, commissions and work with them. And also, of course, we encourage the network between, um, of, among us, of course, international people, international um, colleagues. Uh, if you are not um, aware about our activities, but if you want to follow us, you can um, follow our um, Facebook page um, or also um, ask for information on the website of the SID where there is a special section about the uh, young members group where you can, where you can apply uh, to join the group if you want, or if you may need help or more information, you can get in contact with us. We are happy to, uh, to add some reply to all your, your questions. And all the other information about these uh, webinars. So the webinar will be recorded. So you will find the uh, records of the event um, in a couple of days on the SID YouTube channel, and then it will be shared also on the other social channels, so Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So if you um, if you want to spread the word about these events, you can um, find these um, the records on on the web. And only uh, the panelists are able to speak during the event. So your microphone and video will be uh, turned off during all the event, but you can. Um, um, you can contact us um, by means of the chat and also the Q&A form that is at the bottom of, your, of, the, of the screen. And I will ask you uh, please to uh, put your question, technical question about the webinar in the Q&A form. So it will be easier for us to reply. And all the questions uh, will be answered at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. But please type your question also during the, one, to, during the uh, webinar. We will uh, keep record of your question, and then we will answer all of them during the discussion. And this event is uh, completely free, so there is no uh, charge. But if you are interested in, uh, if you need uh, to get a certificate of attendance, uh, you can contact the SID Secretariat uh, for um, requesting the uh, certification uh, at a cost of 10 Swiss francs. Uh, but uh, this certification is uh, available only for people who attend at least 60% of the webinar. So if you are going to need this kind of certification, you can contact this uh, email address that is in, uh, in this slide. Okay, now uh, we can also uh, introduce our speaker of today, Dr. Moslem Shaverdi. Uh, Dr. Moslem Shaved is a leader of the Advanced Structural Materials Group at the um, EMPA, that is the um, Fed Swiss Federal Laboratories for Materials Science and Technology, uh, based in uh, Zurich. He is also assistant professor at the University of Tehran and teaches at both Zurich and Tehran. During his career, uh, Dr. Uh, Chavez achieved several brilliant achievements and awards, 
and this core uh, research topics and interests um, arise with um, advanced materials and structural reputation and repair, and also seismic retrofit and experimental testing. So today, um, instrumental testing. So today, Dr. Shaverdi will present um, some of the recent developments uh, at the EMPA about the smart materials or shape memory alloys for application for civil engineering structures. And thank you, uh, Dr. Shaverdi, for being here today. And now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Martha, for the introduction. And uh, I say hello to everybody. Uh, from uh, wherever you are, I think for some of you it's early morning, maybe some midday and some even evening. So I'm pleased to present to you today some of uh, our research that has been done at EMPA as uh, uh, Marta mentioned. I would like to also thank the FIP for organizing such uh, event. I had the pleasure to, to actually attend some of them and they were really useful. I thank Marta also for inviting me. So the content of my presentation would be as follow. I will give you a short introduction. Then I will say what is a shape memory alloy, how a shape memory effect in iron-based is working. Then I may make a small comparison between the nitinol SMA and iron-based SMA. We'll talk a bit about the production of FESMA reinforcement and then highlight the advantage of FESMA reinforcement for pre-stressing compared to the existing methodology that we have for pre-stressing. Then it will be followed by some uh, mechanical uh, properties of the SMA that we have found and we'll continue with the examples and at the end I will show you some of the ongoing research and that might be interesting for the young researcher if uh, they want to uh, work on this domain or if they are interested to make collaboration with us. So before I start my presentation, uh, I must acknowledge uh, the uh, SMA group at EMPA. Actually, this group was uh, active uh, uh, long before I joined EMPA, and I was uh, very lucky to join this uh, dynamic group. And as you can see here, we have uh, more than uh, 40 scientists that work in this domain. And I was uh, very fortunate to work with many of them. They are uh, mostly civil engineer, but we have also material engineer, we have uh, electrical engineer, people from the uh, production and also people from the as end user. So now if I want to explain what is a shape memory alloy, uh, let's see this video. So this spring is made of SMA. You can see it is uh, elongated to a length of about uh, 10 centimeter and then it goes back, back slightly, but when the SMA, it put it in the water, it goes back to the original shape, which was about 1.52 centimeter. So this is why we call it shape memory alloy, because it remembers its original shape. And as we are engineer, we would like always to see in terms of uh, stress and strain, what is happening. So at the first we have uh, elongated. So this is what happened here. When we uh, leave it, it comes back some part of it, which this part is a uh, elastic deformation. And then when we put it in the hot water, it goes back to origin almost. And this is the phenomena that we call it shape memory effect. This is a type of the characteristic of SMA that it is shape memory effect, but SMA also, they have another characteristic uh, which as you can see in this video, when you deform them up and unloading, they come back to the origin. So you don't need to apply heating that they, they come back to the original shape. So again, in this case, if we look at the stress strain curve, 
this is what is happening. We uh, make uh, the formation in the in the alloy. So it, you can see here it's heavily deformed. And then when we unload it, it comes back to the origin. So this characteristic is known as super elasticity. And actually most of the known alloy, which are uh, nickel titanium, that I will call them from now on Nikki, they have such a characteristic. And the application of lithinol in other engineering domain has been uh, widely uh, studied and also has been really used. You can see here in the medical, for example, the sense also uh, the braces for the teeth or uh, any part of the body that you can see they put uh, sometimes a piece of SMA to strengthen the body also in uh, airplanes, normally they use um, SMA for actuator. Also in, uh, in automotive industry, again, these SMA are mostly used for actuator and also for the robots and even for soft robots that can, they can fly very smoothly and they are very small robots. So uh, let's see. Really, we can use such a nitinol SMA for civil engineering or not? So the, the answer is yes, it has been used. But however, there is a big problem. And what is this, this big problem? It's the price. And uh, as you may know for uh, application, especially for civil engineering, we are normally using a, a large amount of SMA. And in this case, as the price is almost 100 more expensive than the normal reinforcement, it make it a bit challenging to use them uh, uh, where you want to have a really a, a large qu uh, quantity of the material in use. So what would be the solution? Then the solution is to, to search for a cheaper uh, SMA, for example, those that are uh, copper based or aluminum based or maybe better the iron based. And uh, I can tell you that based on the studies that has been done in the literature, iron based show that they are the best option. Uh, one reason is because of the lower price because here we have a large amount of uh, Fe, iron as the main component. And then they have really high elastic modulus just that you know in the nitty nodes, we are dealing with the uh, young modulus of about 40 G, uh, uh, GPA. But here with uh, iron base, we can reach up to 160, even 200 uh, GPA, which is very similar to the uh, normal uh, internal reinforcement that we can use. Another uh, uh, advantage that I will talk about it later on also, it's the amount of the recovery stress that we get. So here, the amount of recovery stress that we get with uh, uh, iron-based SMA, it's high enough that we can pre-stress, for example, the concrete. And then uh, due to the loss of the pre-stress that we have, still there are some forces that it can stay for a long time. And one other important point that I also will mention it later on, it's about the activation temperature because some of these nitinol they have uh, activation temperature around uh, room temperature. And this means even if you don't want to activate them and then the temperature in the room uh, it is increasing, they might be activated and this is uh, not good uh, uh, for the uh, application. So let's see. Uh, uh, so at EMPA, back in 2003, started from 2003, they realized that a need for uh, FESMA for uh, civil engineering application is really serious. So scientists, material scientists in collaboration with the structural engineer scientists, they work on a different type of alloy composition. And at the end, considering all this, uh, uh, parameter that I mentioned here, they came up with a composition like this, that you can see here, the iron has about 50% of the, the mass ratio, and then we have 17M 
manganese, silicon, chrome, and other uh, precipitate. And here it's good to know that since we have 10% chrome, as you know, chrome, it's good to make the alloy uh, um, uh, resistant to the to corrosion. So if it was more than 12%, we could say it behaved like uh, stainless steel. But now with 10%, we can definitely say it is much about the behavior, the resistance to the corrosion. It's much better than normal steel, but it's still a bit far from the stainless steel. So the research that I will show you may, mainly are from this type of alloy that has been used uh, at EMPA and I will show you. Okay, now let's see how actually this shape memory effect in FESMA is working because the, the mechanism is a bit different than what is in nitinol. So I will not present how it's working in nitinol, but I will show how it works in uh, uh, FESMA. So let's go back to what we had as the sigma epsilon diagram. When we receive uh, F, uh, SMA, uh, FESMA reinforcement, so as received, it's in the austenite phase. What we do, we apply loading and this loading, uh, we will call it pre-straining actually. Then by this uh, pre-straining, we make uh, the form Martin side. So we change the phase of the SMA. And then when we unload it, this phase is stay. So it's not like uh, the two-way SMA in nitinol that when you uh, unload it, it goes back. So when we unload it here, it will stay here. And then the next is when we apply heating that the foreign Martin site will transfer back to the austenite. So that is the mechanism, how it works. But maybe this is not what we want to use it as a, a pre-stressing element in civil engineering. So normally what we do, we do like this. When we make the previous training and then it come back to this point, then we attach it to a structure. So this can be embedded into the structure or somehow we keep the strain constant at this epsilon one. And now when we heat it, you can imagine, so it wants to go back to the origin, but if it is uh, constrained and it cannot go back to the origin, it will apply uh, some sort of a stresses that this stress, we call it actually recovery stress. And if you want to see it also in a phase diagram, normally such a diagram that we plot the stress versus temperature, uh, they are called phase diagram. So in this diagram, we have four uh, temperature that are important. So we have the AS means austenite start temperature. We have AF, which means uh, austenite finish temperature. So this means when we are above the AF, then all the austenite, uh, uh, the, all the transformation to austenite has occurred. And then MS here means if we go below the MS, then it will, uh, the uh, Martin side phase will form. And then if it's below the MF, then it is stable. So I mentioned to you that the activation window and also the, uh, uh, the, the temperature that we need to activate the SMA is important, it is here. So if this window is wide enough, it gives us the opportunity, it gives us the freedom to actually play with it. So here, the step two, as you can see it, it's like this, that we are in a temperature between MS and AF. We apply the stress, here we, uh, we cause the austenite, uh, we change the austenite to martensite, not all of them actually, so part of them. And then when we unload it, we come back to here. Then by heating, we overpass this temperature and then we bring back the phase to the austenite. And this is how the shape memory effect is working. Uh, so that was, the mechanism, how it works. Then in terms of the production, uh, actually uh, we have first produced uh, this uh, alloy, the composition in the laboratory scale, you can see here about uh, 10, 15 kilogram. This was uh, produced in 2012, 2013 in collaboration with uh, 
University in uh, Austria. And then after that, we make it with the forging and hot rolling, we make this cast to a small strip. So in next, I will show you a video how this has been done. So this is the forging phenomena. Actually, it's a phenomena that is applied at the high temperature. You can see here it's red and also you apply the stresses. So this has been repeated to, to make the cross section smaller and smaller. And then we have the hot rolling here that we repeat this procedure until we are getting the thinner and thinner strip. You can see here at the end, we come up with the strip of about two, three millimeter, or if we continue, we can go to 1.5 or even smaller uh, thicknesses. Then the next step for the application, for the production actually in the uh, laboratory scale was to apply the rib because these ribs are needed to make the bonding between the SMA and the concrete. So in this case, we applied the rib by cold deformation by pressure here, but now which the, the production has been uh, all uh, upscaled and in the industrial uh, level. So some of this procedure has changed. So to the, as a result, we have some, uh, we had actually a FESMA a bar with the rib in 2014, diameter eight. Then we were able with the help of the company Reefer, which is actually a spin-off company from EMPA to get the uh, uh, FESMA strip with uh, smooth with two different thicknesses, 1.5 and 0 0.5, and then also in different diameter as a uh, rebar. So now with this product, we can also have really side application. So these are uh, some prototype that uh, exist. And then it's uh, good to know how the, the uh, Sigma Epsilon uh, uh, behavior of the FESMA that has been produced like this with this composition, how it is. So you can see here that it has a higher uh, um, failure stress compared to the normal reinforcement. And it has much, much higher failure strain. You can see here, uh, normally in uh, conventional reinforcement, we have about 10 to 12%, but here we reached up to 40%. And also when we want to compare it with the pre-stressing strand, you can see here, definitely it is lower uh, uh, level in the stress, but much more ductile and also in comparison with the CFRP. So later on, I will also compare the behavior when we have such a reinforcement in a structure, uh, how it works. So the, the concept, as I mentioned to you, is as follows, if we want to use it in a real application. We have the initial FESMA uh, reinforcement, let's say the easiest one, which is uh, unidirectional with the length of L0. Then the second one is what we do, we make pre-straining, as I mentioned, and then we embed it in a concrete, for example, or somehow we uh, attach it, we restrain it in a, to the structure. And then when we apply the uh, electricity, it wants to go back, but since it is a strain, it cannot go back. And then this cause the pre-straining, pre-stressing. So this curve, it uh, summarizes all the three action. So first it is pre-straining, second is activation, and the third it is uh, then when it is in the structure from here on, uh, when we apply the service load. So I will uh, uh, remind you this curve again when I explain more how we use such a reinforcement for pre-stressing or strengthening of the existing structure. But before that, let's see, uh, what is the conventional uh, pre-stressing? So in conventional pre-stressing, one of the technique is like this, that we, uh, we have some duct in the, in the concrete, for example, and then we uh, um, insert a cable in this duct. We then uh, anchor it in one, uh, one end and pull it from, with the jack from the other side to a level of the force that it is uh, needed. 
then we need to fix the other end and then later on fill in the, uh, the duct uh, with uh, some mortar to actually make uh, the, the, the strand re uh, uh, resistant to the corrosion. And in terms of the stress distribution is like this, when we have the pre-stressing, we actually apply, because this is uh, not in the center, we apply a negative moment. Here we have uh, compression, here we have tension, and then when the external load is applied, so some part of this external load is actually used to, to make this part to overcome the pre-stressing, and then this means somehow we increase, maybe we can say it like this, that we increase the tensile capacity of such a structure. So what is the advantage of using uh, SMA uh, uh, reinforcement for pre-stressing when we have such a, a well-established actually uh, pre-stressing system? So one of the advantages is that actually with FESMA reinforcement, we don't need the, the, the end anchorages. And why? Because uh, the FESMA will be directly embedded in the concrete and then the load transfer will be carried out by, will be done by the, the rib that are on the surface of the FESMA. Then we don't need any ducts. So this means the, the, our job will be easier. And in addition to that, when there is no duct, we don't need to make any injection. And also if we are not doing a well injection, then there is maybe some problem with the corrosion. But if uh, the principle is somehow that we don't need the duct, then the problem with the corrosion can be even uh, um, uh, ignored. Then we don't need such a heavy uh, um, uh, hydraulic system to apply the pre-stressing on one head because sometimes applying such a force, it is difficult. Sometimes maybe there are not even good access to do it. And last uh, but not least also when we have the, the uh, SMA reinforcement as a pre-stressing element because they are directly in contact with the concrete and there is no movement between the concrete and the SMA reinforcement. So there is no uh, loss of the pre-stress due to the friction. Good. So these are actually the advantage that uh, we can count on them for uh, uh, making the pre-stressing by uh, FESMA reinforcement uh, compared to the conventional uh, system. So what would be the possible application then? So one of the application, I mean, as a basic, we can use such a technique to actually pre-stress new structure. Like here, we can use the SMA directly as internal reinforcement with the capacity, with the ability that later on we can make them pre-stress or they can be used for uh, a strengthening of uh, uh, existing uh, structure like near surface mounted with shot grid or externally fixed. So I will show you example for these three application first in the laboratory and also later on for a real application. Then they can be used also with the shot grid near surface mounted and also they can be used for confinement and also with uh, as short fiber to make the, the, to increase the capacity of tensile strength of the concrete element. And also they can be used for the prefabrication element that are made by concrete. So before I uh, uh, show you some of the example, I would like to introduce you uh, some of the mechanical properties and uh, also the effect of different parameter on the behavior. So if you remember the, the, the three actions that I mentioned, so the first action was pre-straining. And uh, to better understand the effect of this pre-straining, we have done in the laboratory, uh, we have studied the effect of pre-straining pre at different levels. So you can see here from 0.5% to 8%. And such an such experiment has been done in a Zwick testing machine that you can see here, the SMA are gripped on the upper side and the bottom side, and we used a extensometer 
to, to measure the strain. And then uh, we could measure the stress strain during the uh, previous training. Let's have a closer look on one of these previous training, which is this green one. So when we do the previous training, as you can see here at the beginning, we can uh, imagine some sort of uh, elastic behavior, but maybe I can mention here that actually this alloy, this composition shows a bit of nonlinearity from the beginning. But if we have a global look at it, we can say at the beginning, we have elastic behavior with a young modulus of about 160 GPA. And then we, when we are um, elongating this part, we reach to this 2% that what, what we targeted. When we unload it, as you can see here, it come back some part of it uh, by elastic deformation. So this we can find it out if we um, plot the same line here. So this part of uh, uh, retaining stress strain, we call it elastic strain. And then some part of it that it come back from this curvature, we call it uh, zodoelastic strain. And this is the part that actually helped to improve the super elasticity behavior of such an alloy. So, so far we have understood when we pre-strain to 2%, about, uh, 0.333% is elastic strain, about 0.42% is pseudo-elastic. Now, the next is to, to understand what is this remaining pre-straining? Is this all uh, recoverable or not? Actually, no. So all this is not recoverable. And why? Because some part of it, it is, uh, actually recovery and strain and some part of it because of the plastic deformation. What does it mean? It means that if you remember, I said at the beginning, when we have it, it's in austenite phase. Then when we elongate it, we impose martensite phase. But some part of this uh, nonlinearity behavior is actually because of the plastic deformation, which is not uh, reversible. Now then to, to measure the, the recovery strain, we did such an experiment in the laboratory. So we had the SMA again in the Zwick machine, but this time we have clamped it on one side and leave it open in the other side, but we applied heating. So here you can see it's inside the chamber and then we let it free. So here you can see first when you heat it, it elongates like any other material. So if this material, it was not a shape memory alloy, what would happen? It would behave something like this. So when we heat it, it will, defor it will elongate like this, it go up. And then when we cool it, it will come back to zero. But since this is a shape memory alloy, it didn't behave like this. So at the beginning, it uh, because the thermal expansion is dominant, it behaves like this, but then the phase transformation is dominant. And you can see it, instead of expanding, it is shrinking. So this is then when we reach to the maximum uh, temperature. And then when we cool it due to the uh, thermal expansion, it is shrink back. And this value that you can see here for different level of previous training, we call them the amount of recovery strain that we can get. So imagine for the 2%, which is this green one, uh, we had here about, uh, I think 1.23 remaining. And then from this 1.23 remaining, about 35, 0.35% it's uh, recovery strain. And this can be recovered when we uh, uh, heat it. And in this graph, you can see for different level of pre training. So when we have a pre training of 0 0.5, we can uh, get the recovery strain of about uh, this value and then it increased, but it reached a plateau. So this is why, for example, we say 2% is good enough because after that, then we apply, uh, impose more plastic deformation and then we don't get a higher uh, uh, recovery strain. So one hint, 
when we have when we actually multiply this recovery strain that we have here to the equivalent young modulus of the SMA, we can actually predict the 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 recovery stress, which I will show you later on how we measure it and then how we did compare it to this one. So now we discuss the first part, which is pre-straining. And now let's see uh, for different, uh, the, let's see the activation. So in terms of activation also, uh, it depends on the amount of the heat that you apply. Here you can see if we heat it to a temperature, temperature about 120 degree, we can get a recovery stress of about between 250 and 300. But if we heat it more, then we can get more. And uh, this is uh, actually because when you heat it more, you give more chance to, to more uh, um, austenite phase, sorry, to give chance to more uh, martensite phase to transfer to, to transfer to the austenite. But do you think uh, this is increasing like this? So if we hit it uh, as much as we can, then we can also increase it here also the recovery is stress proportionally. The answer is no, actually. So uh, to understand this, uh, how is the PA, how is the, the relationship between the uh, uh, different activation temperature and the captured recovery stress. So we have started also the activation at really high temperature, but because with the, our machine, we could not hit more than 200 degree. So we made uh, a homemade setup for the activation. So in this homemade, you can see we have two steel column here. Then we have our FESMA element, which is this one. And then this FESMA element, it is anchored or it is fixed to these two end, okay? And also we have strengthened between the two column that the system is rigid enough. Here you can see some of the detail for the thermal, for the electrical isolation, because we use electricity to activate this uh, SMA. And also we have used uh, thermocouple in parallel to infrared camera to measure the temperature of the uh, SMA when we apply the, the temperature. So this is what happened when we apply the temperature. So by increasing the temperature here, the, the recovery stress is also increasing. You can see here, and then it reached to the maximum when it is really cooled down to the room temperature. And here we can see the comparison of different activation temperature when it was pre-strained to 2%. So the blue one, which are all below 200 degree or those specimens that we activate them in a, in a standard in the Zwick testing machine. And the red one are the point that we actually activate them by our customized uh, uh, setup. And then the last step is actually to apply the service load here. So here is the easiest part because then from here on, it will behave like uh, uh, like uh, nonlinear uh, internal or non like a nonlinear uh, uh, steel reinforcement. But we should keep in mind that in this part, then the Young modulus is lower. And for our design, we should not use the Young modulus of 160, but now we should use the Young modulus of 75 for the application of the service load and to predict the behavior in the service load. Okay, now we have understood the mechanism of FESMA and we have understood how, uh, what are the steps to, to use such a, such a alloy in a real application. From now on, I would like to show you some of the example that first we did the study in the laboratory and then where, when there was opportunity, we also had some pilot project. So I will show you an example about the near surface mounted. In this example, I will show, uh, explain more the detail, but in the later on example, then I will go a bit faster. So just to compare what is the near surface mounted in 
uh, comparison to externally bonded or externally unbonded. So here, when we are talking about the near surface, we cut the groove in the, in the concrete cover. We put uh, the uh, FESMA reinforcement in the groove and then we fill it in, uh, with the mortar. But when we have the externally attached or externally unbonded, bonded or unbonded, so this is on the surface. And this is a typical uh, way that normally uh, in the market they use CFRP. So in this case, when we wanted first to study the feasibility study back in 2014, we made some uh, medium-sized beam in the laboratory. So these are some beam with the length of two meter. We cut grooves. At that time, we had the strip with the rib. So we, uh, we embedded the, the, uh, um, the, the rib in the concrete cover and then we turned the beam uh, uh, the other side and we made the connection for the activation. We used resistive heating with such a parameter to, to make the activation. Then to measure the strain during the activation, because you can imagine this is really not a high amount of the strain. So we used a long LVDT over a length of one meter. And then also during the activation, we had infrared camera to somehow capture the, the temperature on the concrete surface. And here you can see how was the deflection in the beam. So first, when we heat up the SMA here, so the beam was going downward. And this is because of the thermal expansion that I mentioned before, because the, uh, the FESMA, which is expanding, so it cannot carry any load. So the beam go, go downward. But when the, act, the activation is working, it pushes the beam upward. And you can see here by time it has progressed. And then we have a good uh, value of uh, bringing the beam upward. I mean, here the value itself is not important because if you put more FESMA, this will change, but the feasibility was more important for us. Here is the infrared camera that I mentioned from the bottom. We are measuring the, the temperature. So the first time you have seen the activation of this one, and now you will see the activation of the second one when it is heated. So you can see it's really fast and the activation, it is all in all in about one minute, but then we need something about um, 30 minutes to cool down to the room temperature. And here we can see the, the comparison from the load versus middle span deflection compared uh, to beam number two. So it's uh, uh, the same beam that it was tested in a four point bending test, but it was not activated. And these two beam, they were activated. So you can here clearly see that the, the cracking uh, force has dramatically increased. And also, if you are interested to know what is the maximum deflection at the level of the force, you can see here the deflection of these two beams that are free stress is much less than the one which is not activated. Then, then uh, uh, one of our PhD students did more study on this technique. And indeed, he studied the bond behavior of such a bar because they are they have less cover. So here I don't go through the detail, but if you are interested, you can have a look on this uh, publication from his work. And then also he tested larger scale uh, slab, which are representing a, a bridge girder like this, because this technique is more usable when we have a problem with the negative bending moment. So here, if we cut such a part, then he also started uh, uh, six beams, so four beam quasi-static and two beam to put them outside for the long-term measurement. And uh, for the comparison, one beam actually, he decided to remove completely the cover. So here is a cover replacement, but the other three, other, uh, yeah, other three he used with the near surface mounted. And also this technique has been used in a real application. Here it's a, a school in winter tour that they actually uh, have the, 
the groove and then and then they fix the bar in both and here and then they used even the flame to activate them and when the activation is finished they completely covered the, the reinforcement so for more uh, application you can visit the website of the refer and you will see much more application then the next example which i want to show you it's uh, when we use uh, uh, reinforcement, FES reinforcement in combination with con with shot grip. So here also we tested in the laboratory first three beams similar to those a small beam that I showed you before, and then we also measured uh, the load uh, mid span deflection and also the cracking of the beam when it is pre-stressed and when it is not pre-stressed. So here you can see. Beam nine, actually, it's a beam which has been uh, strengthened by two uh, normal reinforcement, normal uh, conventional steel, and beam 10, it's the same beam with the same amount of reinforcement, but this time pre-stress because they are actually uh, FESMA. And you can see here again that how much we have improvement in the serviceability limit. But it's good to know that in the in the failure state, there was no big difference between these two. And similar technique has been used uh, in uh, one uh, pilot project. So this is actually uh, a tunnel in Junge Frau that there, uh, there was some problem in the joint between these two. <laughs> So, company Visa, with the help of our student and our trunk, they applied such a, uh, such a rebar and also then after activation, they had a, a spread mortar over them to cover them. Another example, it's uh, for externally uh, and anchorage system. So this is more usable when we are using the, the strip and this this anchorage system also was developed within a master project by Bernard Trans with the collaboration between Refer and Sika. So here we use nail to, to shoot the to, to anchor the FESMA strip to the uh, to the surface of the concrete. And uh, we started different configuration at the end for such a, a width and with the thickness of 1.5 millimeter, we end up that uh, if we use such type of nail with such a configuration, it's good enough to actually transfer all, almost all the capacity, all the, the force that can be transferred by FESMA strip to the concrete. And then with the same technique, we also tested in the laboratory first on larger scale beam. Here you can see the different uh, steps. Even to really represent the real application, we put the beam on a high level and we add the, the FESMA strip uh, like that we you saw. And here it's the, again, four point bending test. You can see how much it is deforming. So it has really a ductile behavior. And then in the same technique, we used it to have a, uh, site application and actually this site application was the first real application with such a, a, a SMA product. So this is a, a building for a person in uh, Villigan and then on the top and upper floor it was a storage with heavy load but in the lower floor which was a parking they wanted to remove some of the wall and then when you remove the wall it had problem with the uh, Flexion and uh, the proposed that was from Refer and from EMPA is to strengthen it with uh, uh, 14 uh, FESMA strip, as you can see in this uh, uh, photo. And here we used the customized uh, uh, box for the activation because here the cross section is quite big and also the length is the length of the strip was uh, relatively long. With normal electricity, uh, we could not activate them. 
Then to control the temperature, also we use thermocouple for the activation. And here it's the video that shows how it works. So here it's when the SMA it is uh, attached. Here was the the for the uh, for the heating the part for the heating. And now the temperature is 20 degrees. You will see it first expand. It goes down. But when the phase transformation is more dominant, then it comes back to the origin and it applies the force to the concrete and it also pre-stress the concrete. So we measured the force, it was about 42 kN actually. Now the next example is also for shear strengthening. So such uh, uh, reinforcement also can be used to make uh, uh, the strengthening of a existing uh, bridge girder, for example, which are weak for shear strengthening. So if you want to use the rebar, we can use it like this. So we drill the hole in the web. We have make we apply the U-shaped um, reinforcement, and then we cover it with the shot grid. Or if you want to use the strip, then we can uh, anchor it here on the top or on the side. So there are also existing. There are also conventional uh, method that uh, they use uh, pre-stressing uh, tendon to to re to strengthen the the concrete element in shear, but they have some problem because it is more complicated. Then they use the end fixation and then there are a lot of loss because of the friction and they are, they need to use many steel parts and these are prone to the corrosion. And since the height actually is not much, then if there is a small slippage in the conventional application in the end anchorage, then it is magnified the stress loss. So here again in the laboratory, first we test uh, uh, six beams, but here intentionally we used uh, heavy reinforcement for the flex char because we wanted to find out actually the limit of such a technique when we have the, the, the pre-stressing in shear. And to have the shear failure, as you know, we have A over D. So A here, it's here, and D is the depth of the, of the beam. So with this one, we can expect some sort of the shear failure. So this is the schematic of the, of the internal reinforcement. And then in this video, you can see the testing of the reference beam. So that was during the loading that the internal stirrups are, they are broken. Uh, we will hear more. Yeah. So actually all four uh, stirrup cross section in this location were, they were broken. And then after the test, we have seen uh, it uh, crack about one centimeter crack opening. Then we decided to, to use this broken beam and actually strengthen it. So here, like the dentist, first we inject uh, uh, we, and we fill in the cracking. And then I start squeezing. We use the U-shaped FESMA here. And then we apply shot squeezing to strengthen the beam for the shear. And then we brought it back to the laboratory and we tested, I mean, after activation, we tested. So here it's also how the activation was done from this uh, uh, part that they were outside. And here you can see the comparison between the force from the beam four, which is uh, the repair of the beam one, which was the reference beam. So here it behaved even better, but uh, uh, that was not actually our aim. Our aim was to really show whether such a technique is feasible or not. Now I will briefly also show you some of the ongoing research and some of the open uh, challenge. 
So one of the ongoing research and challenge that we have is also to, to know how much is the level of the relaxation. So we have done with the same setup that I introduced you before uh, for measuring the relaxation. Uh, here you can see we measure the relaxation for more than uh, 40 days, about 2000 hour, and the relaxation was only about 10%, which is actually a good value compared to also normal reinforcement. And also we have two beams that are uh, outside and these two beams, I think from 2014, we have some uh, uh, sustained load with this concrete block on the beam and they are exposed outside. So they simulate a real uh, uh, con configuration. And here we can see the measurement of the meter span deflection over time for these two beams. So one beam is actually pre-stressed, which is uh, activated, and one beam it is not activated. And the good news is that they behave the same. So it means that the relaxation from the SMA, it's not really much that we see different uh, behavior from the activated in comparison with the non-activated. Then another uh, ongoing research is that we want to increase the recovery of stress. So here, one of our uh, PhD students is working on this topic. And uh, at the moment with some heat treatment, we have been able to actually increase the, the recovery of stress by 60%, but our aim is to even increase it more. Then another project here is the video from YouTube from Professor Saidi in USA. So this is a column on the shrinking table. So in this column, they used the technique, uh, some sort of technique that after the earthquake, it brings back the column to the original. So it is self-centering. And now we want to use our uh, SMA reinforcement uh, to apply uh, to have the column pre-stressed and with this pre-stressing actually uh, apply the self-centering. And here a postdoc is working on this in collaboration with uh, uh, our colleague in USA and also our uh, 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 industrial partner. The other two ongoing, it's uh, the application of SMA for the pre-stressing of the 3D printed concrete. So as you may know, there is a big group at ETH that they are working on uh, printing concrete. Here you can see some of their examples, some of their work. And this is also actually a work that they have done in the Tempa. And the one challenge here is to actually have the reinforcement during the printing. And we think when we can use pre-stress uh, reinforcement, we can reduce the amount of the reinforcement and then somehow also uh, reduce the challenge. And also with the pre-stressing that we get from the, from the reinforcement, uh, we can close the cracks that are due to the shrinkage. And there is another ongoing project that we want to use uh, for SMA fiber in combination with the ultra high performance concrete. So at Tempo, our colleague, uh, Christoph Czaderski and uh, some of his colleagues, they did some research on uh, fiber SMA, but with nitinol. Now, when we have the cost effective uh, iron based, we want to actually use this uh, SMA and see how it works. So in these two projects, also two postdocs are working on it. So to summarize my uh, presentation, so we started with the uh, production of the SMA in the laboratory. Then we had some uh, feasibility study in the laboratory. Then we had the uh, upscaling of the production. And then when we have the upscaling of the production in the industrial level, we were able to also have some real application. And with this one, we are also uh, using the SMA for uh, different application. And all this progress actually was thanks to the group that we work on it because it was really an interdisciplinary group. We had uh, also opportunity to work with many colleagues uh, uh, nationally and internationally also, uh, I mean, um, industrial colleague and also uh, research colleague. So I also thank our uh, collaboration 
without their help. So their help sometimes was uh, financial help, like uh, from Böhler, from uh, uh, SNS, uh, from Reefer, or sometimes was uh, scientific help or logistical or for material. So with that, I close my presentation and I'm happy to answer to any question, comment that uh, you may have. Thank you very much, Muslim, for this amazing presentation and webinar. We have uh, some questions in the Q&A and also in the chat. Um, so I will start reading from the audience. Uh, meanwhile, other people that are interested in to interact with the, with the speakers and type their question in the Q&A form. So um, the first question is from Chong Yong Gong, Tony, um, from Malaysia. So when the strip is attached in the bottom fly fiber of the beam, so we are talking about the externally bonded um, SMA system. So what type of epoxy is needed to ensure the strip firmly attached to the existing beam? Uh, so actually we studied uh, the externally bonded with some sort of epoxy, but because when we hit the SMA, we often go above the TG of the epoxy. So we didn't follow up uh, uh, such application. And those applications that I showed you, it was externally unbonded. So it was only uh, attached from both and by the nailing system that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this question was actually asked before, then I think, yeah, that slide about the EC connection uh, answer to this one. And the second question is quite the same because what types of adhesive do you use for bonding uh, reinforcement to the substrate? So basically the bonding is just mechanics. I mean, we don't have any other uh, option. I mean, uh, here, if by chance, uh, he means uh, the, also the bonding when we have it embedded. So it's not an adhesive, it is actually a, uh, cement based mortar and uh, so that is somehow a mortar that can have some uh, expansion uh, compensation not to have shrinkage cracks and it's also compatible with the concrete and also compatible with the uh, VSMA but uh, uh, we didn't use any type of epoxy if you mean uh, epoxy by adhesive. Okay. In the case of near surface mounted system, uh, in that case, do you use a sort of anchorage? I mean, before the activation, uh, how did you perform this? Uh, I mean, do you have any problem of the bonding, uh, for instance, uh, in the case of near surface mounted application? Uh, actually, uh, if the bonding length is very small, we can have problem. But if the bonding lens is above a value, uh, which uh, Bernard Schranz has studied this in detail. So I referred the, the questioner to study this paper from him. So we didn't face any problem when we use uh, this type of uh, uh, mortar. And also he studied uh, when we activate. So this means when we apply some sort of heating. Does mm -hmm. this heating uh, cause problem or not? But uh, he found out that uh, the, the bonding lengths that he used for the larger scale beam was good enough. And there was actually almost zero sleep from the, uh, from the bonding part. OK, thank you. Uh, then we have another question from Akram Jadari. Uh, also, is there any a way to apply uh, the heat activation in the manufacturing stage or prior to shipping? This could reduce cost of installation significantly. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the idea is, as I mentioned, these three, three actions. So we, we, we make the SMA pre-strained, so we elongate it. Mm -hmm. And then after this, we uh, attach it to the structure. And then when it is attached, we want to activate it to go back to the origin if it is free, but since it is not free to pre-stress. But if you do this before you're attaching to the, uh, to the structure, then it will go back to the origin and uh, there is no 
benefit out of it. Exactly. Okay. Uh, then we have another question from Mohammed Arslan Yakub. Uh, what temperature did you achieve for shear strengthening application? Uh, being an embedded under shot creep, the process must be very slow and difficult. Uh, where is this? Ah, what temperature? So here we also apply the temperature about 160, 180 degree. And uh, this uh, temperature, uh, it is really on the safe side, not to damage the, the concrete around the bonding. And this has been done again by the resistive heating, as I showed you. And then compare, uh, coming back to uh, the second part of the question, being embedded in the uh, No, actually, uh, when we had the girder, if you may remember, so we drilled the hole in the web of the in the web of the gear there, and then the hole was filled in again with the uh, uh, cement-based mortar, and this cement base also had uh, um, expansion property, and that was good enough to actually make the bonding sufficient. So there also there was no uh, steepage. And uh, uh, the same technique ha has been also used in a pilot project in Switzerland, in uh, City Baden. Uh, you may see it in the website of Refer, actually. Okay. Thanks. Good. Uh, then let's just move to Mohamed Kodaverdi. Uh, does the application of the UCFC SMA already uh, included in codes and standards, either national or international standards? Uh, no, actually, this is a good question, but because we are in the earliest stage, I mean, not really earliest stage, the work has been started uh, a long time ago, but with the uh, a scale up system that we have a uh, um, bar and a strip that can be used uh, uh, in a kilometers or in a meters. So this study has been uh, uh, carried out for this application over the last two, three years. And I know that the company Reefer, which is a spin-off company of EMPA, is following the certification and also to, to have it as a product that can be used by engineering office. But nevertheless, the technique with all the system that has been developed by us and with Reefer, they have been used more than 60, 70 uh, real application. So I again refer you to have a look on the website of Reefer to see uh, the application. Okay, then from Mali, Ebrahimi, Emami. Uh, are there any FE uh, based machine memory alloy developed thus uh, far with good super elasticity? Uh, yes, this is also a good question. Actually, uh, in our group, we are working on this, but again, the, uh, we have started only last year. So we are at the beginning, but I have heard that colleague uh, in uh, Japan or in Germany, they have uh, a, a similar FESMA that they uh, have produced in laboratory scale that they show uh, good super elasticity behavior. Okay, then um, from Amir Kari, have you examined the cyclic behavior of this um, iron-based shape memory alloy? Uh, yes, yes, uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, uh, Gafuri, uh, he has studied this in detail. And uh, uh, maybe it's good to know that uh, since uh, this uh, alloy, it's like a fine uh, alloy. I mean, it's a really good material. It shows a much better uh, fatigue performance compared to the conventional uh, steel. And if you are interested, Amir, uh, you may also see the work from uh, Sawaguchi in Japan. So he used actually a brace made of part of a brace uh, made of uh, FESMA, and he didn't use uh, the feature of uh, 
shape memory alloy, shape memory effect, or shape uh, super elasticity. He just used this alloy because he believed it has a good uh, uh, fatigue behavior. So I visited uh, him in 2015 or 16. He showed me the system, and I think they have used it in a tower in uh, Japan that has been opened uh, in 2016. So if you are interested, please have a look on our paper or on uh, uh, Sawaguchi's work from Japan. Okay, then still from Mohamed Kodaverdi, um, would you please describe the behavior of pre-stressed members with the application of this uh, FE, uh, FMA? Uh, so it is the same as the pre-stressing uh, that we have with conventional, although at the moment the level of the pre-stressing force is a bit lower, but the mechanism, I mean, the effect that we see on the stresses is exactly the same. So when we do the activation, we apply, if it's like, uh, for example, uh, uh, simply supported beam, we apply imposed uh, negative bending with activation, and then this help us to carry better the service load. So the effect or the, the behavior, as you ask, is similar. Okay. And there is another question always from the same author from, about the fatigue behavior of these pre-stressed members. So the fatigue behavior of alloy, of such an alloy has been studied, but actually we are planning to study also the, the fatigue behavior of a, a structure, because that might be a bit different than uh, only studying the fatigue behavior of uh, the reinforcement uh, alone. Okay, so now do you think we can replace the whole traditional reinforcement system, so conventional steel, with shape memory alloys, iron-based shape memory alloys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, principally, yes, but we need to, to know that the price of the FESMA reinforcement is more than, uh, is more than the conventional reinforcement. And we need to really think uh, whether it is needed or not. But uh, principally, I mean, and theoretically, this can be done when it is needed. There is no issue. I mean, there are some small issue. And if you have all the reinforcement, then if you activate them all together, then you might heat up the concrete uh, too much. But those are things that uh, one can, uh, uh, can tackle them and solve the problem. If it is needed actually to have only uh, FE reinforcement as the as the internal reinforcement. Okay. So uh, another comment from Arif uh, Wibobo. Uh, great innovation and also awesome presentation. Wow. It looks like it, this will become a game changer. I'm mm. in infrastructure and building project. Okay. I think this is not a question. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, uh, yes, this technique, it is new. And uh, uh, you are somehow right, because as I mentioned, only in last two, three years, uh, 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 we have been able to, to apply such a technique in reality in more than 60, 70 real application. And you will know when a new technique comes to the market, mostly civil engineering are a bit hesitating to use it, but now, when they see the advantage, when they see that they can trust on it, uh, they, it has been used, uh, uh, I think, quite rapidly from the beginning. Okay, here yeah, another interesting question from Andri, Sekia One. So during the operational state of the building, what happens to these shape memory alloys when subjected to uh, factor heating due to fire or blast? Uh, is there any some sort of limit to the temperature that can be subjected to these iron based shape memory alloys before it starts damaging uh, or reducing the properties? 
Yeah, so uh, yeah, this is also a good question. Actually, uh, within a master project uh, in collaboration with uh, ETH Zurich in uh, 2017 or 18, I don't remember when, we have studied the, this topic and uh, I can tell you the summary. So what we have seen there, if you hit the, the concrete element, which is, uh, for example, uh, reinforced with FESMA reinforcement up to a temperature of about 300, maybe even 400, then the FESMA help you. And the reason is because uh, when the SMA it is heated, it, uh, more phase transformation will happen. And this more phase transformation means it will uh, overcome the expansion and then the concrete structure will fail down uh, uh, later. But when you heat it uh, really at elevated temperature, like uh, 800, 700, then uh, it behave similar to conventional uh, reinforcement. And then you need to consider when you are designing. So we have a, a paper on this subject. Uh, you can find it if you're interested. Perfect, thank you. Uh, then there is some question is more conceptual about the initial part of the presentation. So why this uh, shape memory alloys should be within the temperature window between uh, MF and AS to allow Martin Sipa's formation take place? Yeah, yeah, this is a good question. So we want that the room temperature plus some additional temperature that the structure can uh, uh, can uh, reach to this temperature when it is functioning to be in this part between uh, AS and uh, M A AS, AS and MS. Why? Uh, because uh, imagine if the austenite start temperature, it's only 20 degrees. And then you have a alloy, which is in martensite phase. So you make pre-straining you, uh, you make uh, uh, twinned martensite deformation. And then if the room temperature is 20 degree, then it can actually activate it. So it doesn't let you to use it, to benefit it. Or if you just store it, then it can uh, be activated and then you don't get the, the function that you want. So that window actually it is very important when one wants to, to design a new alloy that can be used for such type of application. So if somebody wants to use it in a, a minus uh, 200 Kelvin, then that is another story. But for a civil engineering application, this window is really important. Okay, thank you. Uh, then, uh, what happened from Rake and Yuto? Uh, what happened when repetitive heating or forces applied to the F um, shape memory alloys is quite the same of the fire uh, and blast? Uh, so, here, if you mean uh, heat that it is uh, uh, not elevated temperature, uh, so when this heating temperature it is below the activation temperature. So imagine that we have the FESMA reinforcement used in a concrete, and then we apply 160 degree, for example, to activate it. And now if it is again heat to 150 degree or below, the heating almost make no changes. But if you heat it above the heating, the activation temperature, then it might also make more uh, uh, phase transformation. So if there are some part in the, in the reinforcement that are on the martensite phase, they can be transferred to the austenite phase. So this is actually good for us because uh, we were thinking it, uh, when by time, if the recovery stress is reduced, then you can go back again and reheat it and then you increase again 
the uh, recovery uh, stress. And then the loading, if you mean the fatigue loading, I think uh, I answered to this part. Now let's move to Prasal Sebakari. So would it be possible to make small steel fibers of uh, iron basic chain memory alloys and then they are, are activated to stress the wall concrete matrix in these concrete elements, especially used in um, ultra performance concrete matrix? Yeah, yeah, I hope so, because now we have two postdocs that they, are, they want to work on this topic. Yeah, so it is possible. I mean, all feasibility preliminary study so that this is possible. Okay. So there are advantages of these iron based memory alloys for pre-stressing, and there were no pre-stress or friction loss. But the slide number 43, uh, you're saying there is complication in practical application and there is a loss of friction. Could you please more elaborate it? Uh, let me see a slide 43. 43, it's about uh, shear strengthening. Uh, if you mean uh, 42, actually, then what I was mentioning, it was uh, the problem with the uh, conventional pre-stressing of uh, uh, bridge gear there for shear, because there are some mechanisms, some system that they use to pre-stress a web of a, of a gear there uh, to pre-stress it. And then this system that they use it has those uh, drawbacks that I mentioned. So it has a, a many part or many steel part. It, uh, lo it there are some loss due to the friction and all the point that I mentioned. So that was uh, actually about the conventional pre-stressing in the web of a gear, and not about the FESMA. Okay. Uh, then, from Ali, Ibrahimi, and Mamie, uh, could you please give us an idea about the cost of these materials? We partially already answered to you. So about the yeah, cost. I mean, the uh, exact uh, cost uh, uh, per kilo, I cannot tell you because it depends on the amount of the uh, reinforcement that one can order, all these things. But what I can tell you is that um, uh, if one compare the pre-stressing system to make a concrete element pre-stress, especially for the strengthening, and compare this system with existing system like pre-stressing by CFRPs, then the total uh, cost uh, would be uh, lower in case of FESMA. So maybe the material cost itself, it's a bit higher, but because the application of the system is much easier and also you don't need the end anchorages and you don't need to have a lot of precaution measurements. So all in all, the cost of the application of the system, it is uh, reasonable and it can uh, compete with the existing uh, technique. Okay. Uh, then from Alireza for you, Zap. Um, in the application of the shed memory alloy three bars in closing crack spaces in limbs under pure bending, is there any code instruction about how many three bars are needed based on the beam dimension and the concrete properties? Uh, no, actually, as I mentioned to before, there is, uh, at the moment, there is no code or standard. But if a researcher like you wants to, to have some ideas, maybe you can see the ACI for the tendon, and then you use the same forces. I mean, there are some differences, like the ductility in this case, when you use FESMA, it is much more uh, better compared to the tendon. But if the level of the stress is, is uh, uh, only concern that you have and you want to tune it to some sort of uh, uh, real cases, maybe you can get help from there. Okay. Then from Terence Oi, uh, what happened when there is a fire accident nearby the FSA is I think okay, it is the mm -hmm. Okay. And 
Do you think uh, that the application of this uh, iron bisection memory alloys is almost limited to the retrofit and rehabilitation of existing structures, or does, does it uh, make sense to use in new construction? Uh, yes and no. So it depends. Uh, we have project now ongoing to use it actually like uh, for a new structure. As I mentioned, an example to use the SMA reinforcement in combination with 3D printing of uh, concrete. So that is one example which is ongoing. And then the second uh, point that I can tell you indirectly, if we manage to increase the recovery stress uh, to the values that I mentioned, like uh, two times or three times that what we have now, then I'm sure there will be new door open for us and also for such application, especially for the new structures. Okay. okay. Then from Ali, Abrahimi, Emamia, uh, why Martin site transformation is reverse reversible for iron-based uh, SMA in contrast to conventional steel? Uh, to my understanding, some sort of slip happen within the crystalline, crystalline structure of the material. Uh, my question is why this slip is not reversible in steel, but is reversible in shape memory alloys? Yes, so this actually, uh, it, uh, it is linked to the, to the arrangement of the alloys, of the atoms. So for example, when we have FCC, when they are Face cubic centered, or when we have HCP, that uh, so this is one mechanism in the FESMA. Actually, the the Martin side transformation, it is a move of the alloy, so they move slightly, and then the the link between the atoms is not broken. In comparison, when we have a plastic deformation, for example. And this is why it can uh, come back again. But if you are interested to, to know more in detail, uh, please have a look at our paper. Uh, we have a review paper from 2014. The first uh, author is Tony Cladero. And there we have explained more uh, details. But in summary, what I can tell you is that uh, uh, the, the the phase transformation in FESMA, it is only because of the movement of the atom. So it's not uh, 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 the, the fold, energy fold between the layer that it is changed. Okay. Uh, then another question from Andri Sekiawan. So do you think there is a potential to adjust different temperature to the FESMA? as a function of the applied load during construction stage, for example, for bridges, when only self-weight is present, only apply, you apply lower temperature, but then after the bridge is operational, we apply higher temperature, just a curiosity. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is a good curiosity. Yeah, it, 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 in theory, we can do that, but uh, um, uh, um, I mean, in reality, maybe uh, a client or a construction body is not happy to go there and uh, play with it. But if it is justified, yes, we can do that actually. Or another example that I mentioned before is when uh, in case that uh, we see some uh, loss of the stress, for example, due to the creep of the concrete, then we can go and activate it to a higher temperature to, to, to recover the, the lost stresses. Okay. Uh, then uh, what are some splicing techniques for the uh, iron-based shape memory alloys rebars? Uh, I don't know, does he mean a spl a splicing means to cut them or? Uh... I have an idea, maybe the author also in this case can... Uh, but if you mean to cut them, so it is true that SMAs in general, they are hard material and not all, uh, all uh, 
workshop are happy to cut them because sometimes their tool are broken. Uh, but uh, uh, with this FESMA, because most part of it is actually iron, uh, we didn't have uh, a huge uh, problem in this case. If I understood correctly. No, the author yeah. said that uh, he's talking about the connection. So how to connect these Ah, OK, like to weld them. Yeah, yeah. So we, we did some welding test. It is uh, possible to weld them. It is uh, possible to apply thread and then weld them uh, and then connect them by the uh, by the 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 thread and also it is a possible like a conventional steel to have overlap uh, when uh, you have them in a real structure okay and last question from me up to uh, can shape memory alloys apply on every construction works i mean definitely no no when you say every so there are some uh, limitations. But uh, the example that I showed, I think more or less uh, they represent uh, uh, several applications, but it is not actually limited. So because here I try to focus more on the concrete uh, structure, but uh, for other structure also can be used. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and then we have um, another question. It is necessary to secure the structure from power lines. Secure the uh, structures from power lines. Uh, does it mean from uh, electricity? Not sure. Maybe also in this case, we can ask the author to maybe re-elaborate a bit this question. What it, it means with power lines? Um, Okay, here another question. So, um, can shape memory alloys be used to make steel strands? Steel strands are often used in pre stressed structures. You mentioned that the temperature changes. Will the deformation of the uh, shape memory alloys affect the steel strand itself? Will the steel strand come apart? So, here he, uh, he or she asked many questions. And uh, I think uh, to answer them uh, correctly, I need to split them. So first of all, uh, the idea of having them as a strand, like what we have with the steel strand, maybe it's not the ideal idea. Why? Because when you make the strand, you wrap them around. And imagine if you have uh, uh, SMA wire that you used, for example, a typical one that they use seven wire to make a strand. But then when you activate them, maybe the, the, the coming back effect, the shape memory effect, it is used to close the gap between the wire. So I think it is not ideal. However, some of our colleagues in USA has used this technique and I have seen uh, uh, some of their publication. So uh, it is not impossible, but maybe it is not the ideal case. So it's better to use uh, a rebar instead of a strand. This is one. And then you said when the temperature change, the deformation change. So please don't mix this again, because when the temperature is changed, we can actually have higher recovery strain Okay, and if we are in the ideal case that uh, that the, the SMA reinforcement it is bonded in the concrete or it is fixed on both ends, so we expect that there is no no uh, strain, so the strain is zero. And this means if you increase the temperature, uh, you increase the recovery force or recovery stresses. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Uh, I know we, I think we don't have any other question because uh, until we will wait, we want to wait for this other from Arif Wibowo. 
uh, in the chat there are several comments with positive feedbacks. Uh, so thank you very much for this uh, presentation, uh, outstanding results, and also an opportunity to discover some of the uh, results of an experimental test that you are um, going, I mean, you are planning and uh, in doing at the EMSA. And I have just another curiosity for me uh, is about the strengthening of columns um, for seismic, I mean, seismic strengthening. How you're going to, I mean, uh, the application of active confinement, because as far as I understood, you want to apply a sort of give up. In this case, how do you want to, I mean, how can you can activate the, the shape memory alloys if they are inside the, the, the yeah, yeah, this is also a, a great question. So in this case, if we plan to use them uh, for uh, strengthening, we will remove the, co the cover of uh, existing column. Then if we need to apply the longitudinal one, we put the longitudinal reinforcement, or if we only need to have the lateral one, the spiral, we put the spiral, and then we activate them. After the activation, we cover it by the shaft creep. So this is uh, what we will do with uh, 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 for the strengthening. But in case that the spiral is also embedded in a, in a column, if you have uh, two connection, I mean, two cable imagine that are going out from top and bottom of this uh, spiral, then you can uh, apply electricity and with this, uh, resistive heating, you can actually activate them. But this needs to be uh, mm -hmm. taken in consideration before the, the casting. Okay. And are you going to test also rectangular? Um, I mean, because I've seen a circular columns, which is quite easier than rectangular cross-section. Do you think this is applicable also in the case of rectangular um, piers or um, columns in general? I think at the first step, no, uh, because uh, we want to better understand for uh, uh, the effect of uh, self-centering, because uh, again, on paper, by our calculation, this works. But as you know, maybe <laughs> better than me. So you, you really need to, to examine it and also to see the challenges, to see the limitation. And then uh, when this is done, uh, we might also, in a follow-up project, uh, think about the rectangular column, as you mentioned, which is a bit more complicated than the circular cross-sections. Absolutely. OK, I don't think we have any other questions. So thank you again very much for accepting this invitation and for being here today with us. And uh, all the, I mean, the records will be available on the YouTube channel of the FIB. So for who is asking, uh, the, um, the video will be available in a couple of weeks, I guess. And also the um, contact of the of Muslim is in the presentation. So if you want to have a faster discussion with him, you can contact him in person. I hope also this can be an occasion to start new collaboration, maybe uh, with other people. And so thank you again. And the last, uh, Last, last part of the presentation, uh, next um, meeting, uh, the last of the year is another webinar um, from uh, Dr. Leonardo Turizzo about the post-tensioning uh, for structural innovation, an overlooked perspective. It will be in December. And so please follow the events of the, on the FIB uh, webpage for uh, subscri subscribing event and follow our, um, our news. Thank you again for all the attendees and thank you again, Muslim, and hope to see you soon. Please stay safe and good evening. Yeah, thank you again, Martha and your group to organizing such an event. Keep going. It's, uh, I think you started this year because of the uh, home yeah. office working and I think it's a nice movement uh, in these days. Yeah, I wish uh, you and all the participants also a good time and stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a bye nice bye. time. Bye bye.